the Flair Institute at Dubna. Um, they just ran the table for a decade and just filled in almost an entire row of the, of the periodic table here. This was exciting work, uh, the real cutting edge of nuclear chemistry um, and nuclear science. Um, and so, Don, uh, take it away. All right, thank you, Carl. so much for inviting me back. I don't, considering we're only like 30 miles apart, I don't get down here very often. And I, and I think I, this is only the second time I've ever been to talk anywhere at Berkeley, so it's kind of always nice to be back. Um, I'm always surprised there's a new building every time I come. Some building has sprouted up somewhere. Yeah, it's really amazing. Um, so today, Carl asked me to talk about our heavy element program at Livermore, uh, which has been going on basically since the lab was started in the early 50s and continues today. Um, we're in a little bit of a hiatus because the lab in Russia we work with is actually building a brand new accelerator. So we're a little bit uh, kind of waiting for that, but uh, very exciting work. And uh, Carl had asked me to give sort of an overview of the program and then to talk about our current work, which is really more focused on the nuclear chemistry side of things. So the first half of my talk is going to be a little bit more historical, less technical, but uh, some very interesting tidbits in there. And then uh, I'll talk later about the the chemistry that we're doing and I always have to start with this because it, it's a preemptive slide because usually if I'm talking to whether it's kids in a school or a funding agency one of the first questions I get is why does anyone care about new elements anymore and the answer is everyone should care about new elements because it really determines the fundamental nature of matter I'm not being cheesy at all I mean that's for real um, here at Berkeley, of course, we have a very strong tradition of discovering new elements, and it really wasn't that long ago when the periodic table ended at uranium in 92. And considering since Seaborg's times and, and doing work in the 30s and 40s, and now that we have up to element 118, it's really not that many years to have filled all that out. And where we go next is really the big question because we're, as I'll explain later, we're sort of in a part where we, we think physically we can go there, but technology-wise, we're probably going to be in a little bit of a wait. Um, but I'll get into that later. So that's the, the impetus for this work. It's really just fundamental science. Where is the end of the periodic table? And what does it tell us about the theories of physical matter? So as I mentioned, uh, Livermore opened its doors in 1952. If you don't know where Lawrence Livermore is, it's 30, 45 miles, almost due east of here. It's like a totally different world <laughs> than here. Um, it used to be farming country. It's grown up a lot since then, even from when I started there 12 years ago. Um, but it's a lot different than Berkeley, I'll tell you that. But in the beginning, Seaborg sent several of his students out to Livermore to get the lab started. And I put this in here because a lot of you will know that this is Ken Moody back in the day doing uh, radiochemical diagnostics. And the point in the beginning was very straightforward. Livermore had a mission, it was one of the nuclear weapons labs, and so it performed nuclear weapons tests, and they would send debris after a test back to the lab, and they would do diagnostics on it, and that's exactly what Ken Moody is doing here. But in addition, because they didn't do testing all the time, they had to give the scientists, for lack of a better word, something to do when they weren't testing. So there was some free energy in terms of money to do real science, and uh, a lot of you also know the late Ken Hewlett and Rob Loki, who were at Livermore for a long time, and they really got a heavy element program going um, with some of this funding that was really to keep scientists active, so to speak, in the off times of testing. But they really believed in the heavy element mission, and they are responsible for what happened in the intervening years. But if I step back a little bit, um, this is 1974, I was alive, most of you probably were not. Mm -hmm. um, even back then, there was uh, work being done by Livermore. I mean, Berkeley was really, Berkeley was it at this time in terms of heavy element discovery. I mean, really all of these here, if we just chug along, these are all Berkeley discoveries. But in 74, uh, there was a joint effort by Berkeley and Livermore to discover what is now Seaborgium, element 106. But if we go back even farther to when Livermore opened in 52, um, Einsteinium and fermium were discovered as part of a nuclear weapons test, and uh, these were very active collaborations at the time between Berkeley and Livermore after Livermore started. 
But what happened after that is sort of telling in terms of the history of, of politics at the time. So after Seaborgium, this is sort of, there's a big invisible line here that I'll draw with you, for you with the laser. And what that line is, is when the US lost its dominance in terms of this field. Because at the time, the US was chugging along here, discovering all these elements, doing chemistry on them. Seaborg was still very active in a lot of these. And then we got to here. And this is when the GSI lab, which is in Darmstadt, Germany, really took over. And every time there's a leap like that, there's usually a technology leap as well. And so here, what was going on is there was a lot of neutron capture and light particle capture to get to these new elements. And here the Germans did something. It's cold fusion, but it's not the cold fusion you're thinking of. It's cold fusion being that they're starting to bombard things like lead and bismuth targets and they start marching up the periodic table. So this is now 1989. And the other thing that was happening is with these reactions, the cross sections were plummeting really fast. So that meant they were getting one atom at a time over long periods of running. So around this time, it was really a question of how much farther would this go? Because the technology was there to slam things together at the accelerator, but the production rates were getting really low and the U.S. was sort of out of the game here. So it really looked like Germany would march along and at some point they might also hit some wall and that might be it. What are the name of those uh, last elements, 107? This is Borium, Hossium, and Mitarium. Now, the real quick, and I'm sure this crowd knows this, so I won't dwell on it. The impetus for discovering new elements is actually twofold. There's one I mentioned, which is just going back here, this question of how far can we go here. And then there's the, the, the physics behind it. If we calculate what we can do versus what we can actually do with technology. But then there's this search for the next magic numbers of protons and neutrons. So as you all know in this room, if we get to certain stable nuclear configurations, mix the nucleus, have more isotopes, it lives longer, it's much more stable, much more resistant to decay. The ones that are outlined in red have magic proton or closed proton shells. And there's, for instance, you look at lead, there has something like 12 isotopes of lead um, because it's such a stable nucleus. But after lead, the question is, what's the next magic proton number? And the theory for this has changed a lot over the years, but the initial theory said it should fall right here at 114. And at that point, if 114's nucleus was really the next magic nucleus, did that mean that chemically 114 belonged here, or did it make it something that looked more like a noble gas? Because now you might have a stable electronic configuration due to relativistic effects. So what are relativistic effects really quick? If you go down a group, as you're also aware from freshman chemistry, you see similarities in chemical properties going down the group until, the caveat is, you get down here to the transactinides. And that's because these are such massive nuclei, and they have so many protons in it, that they actually start to change the electronic configuration of the valence electrons. So now you have cases where you have contraction of inner shell, and that allows the outer shell electrons to actually become more diffuse, and it can actually change the chemistry. So if you look at group five right here, which is vanadium, niobium, tantalum, and deuterium, 105, if you look at certain chemical systems, let's say an extraction system, you might see that you have less extraction going down the group until you get to 105 where it goes back up again. And it's because of these relativistic effects. So now we can over here, and our, theor our theorist friends tell us that 114 might be the next super stable magic nucleus in terms of proton number. But what does that also mean for its chemistry? And if you go back to some of these papers and look up element 114, a lot of them said that this would be a noble gas. So that's sort of the quest is, what is the next magic proton number? And is it a noble gas or is it not? Imagine now if this really is a noble gas, you have to rethink how the periodic table looks over here. And we can't just march them up by number, we actually have to go in and restructure it. So this picture was put together by our colleagues in Dubna, which is in Russia. 
I still use it, even though it's quite old now, because it, it's really pretty. Uh, it, it doesn't come out well on the screen, but you know, back in the days, okay, this is before computer graphic design, they actually had people paint this, and it just the originals are, are quite lovely. It's unfortunately not made the test of time or the pixelated world. But when these theories came out that 114 could be the next magic nucleus, it really gave a new mission to the heavy element program in the, around the world. Because what was happening is, as you went from the actinides, and this is supposed to be the light actinides moving through the heavy actinides, you get to the point where spontaneous vision kills you. So if you try to make a new element, they're not sticking together very long at all. And they're basically splitting apart the minute they're made. So the question was, how do you leap over this? Because if you can get to the next closed proton shell, the idea was these things could be extremely long-lived. And by extreme, I mean, again, if you go back to these early papers, they were predicting hundreds of thousands of years. And in fact, there was a huge push to search for element 114 in nature. These are some very interesting articles. So they went in and got these very old ores, and they went to the ocean and dug up these very old um, minerals from the bottom of the ocean looking for element 114. And they did not find any, because as we know now, I'll get the punchline out now. It does not live hundreds of thousands of years, but it does live longer than things that came before it. So, we know that this part, the days are longer, is probably not true, but seconds is true, so we will get there. So, real quick, let me talk about this collaboration, because this is a talk in and of itself. Um, I know a few of you were at our Livermore Day celebration in Livermore a few years ago, and Ken Moody gave a really fantastic talk on the history of this collaboration. Um, but you have to put yourself in a different mindset, and I, and I fear, well, I mean, it's good. It's good that the younger generation doesn't know what the Cold War is, but the, the, how important this was at the time, I think, gets a little lost today, because back in the late 80s when this collaboration was formed, both countries were still testing nuclear weapons, and they hated each other, and any minute we were going to annihilate each other with, to, completely out of existence. But during this time, uh, Georgi Flaroff, who the Flaroff Institute is named after, he and Ken Hewlett, who was at Livermore, they were at a conference together. And I mean, there's a lot of lore now about vodka and all that, and I don't know if any of that's true, but what did come out of that is they decided that they wanted to restart the search for heavy elements, that the Germans had done their thing, it was time to do theirs, and they were both really interested, but neither group really had enough to do it alone. The, the Russians had this low-torch cyclotron where they could get tons of beam, but they really admittedly didn't have the expertise at the time to do position-sensitive detection or any of these things that now we do as a matter of course. These guys, Ron Loki and Ken Moody, did have that expertise from having beamline work at the 88-inch up on the hill. So they decided to form this very unlikely collaboration in the late 80s, where these two powerhouses put all the political nonsense aside and did science. And this picture was taken, um, Ron and Ken spent a month in Dubna. Dubna is about two hours outside of Moscow. And it's, it reminds me a lot of uh, other national labs in the US, not Berkeley and Livermore so much, but the other labs where the town is the lab and the lab is the town live in the town, you work at the lab, vice versa. Duna is very small like that. If you work at the institute, you live in the town. And it, it's, like, it's a, like a college town, too, you can think of it that way. These guys went, it was still the Soviet Union. They have stories, I won't get into them all now, but they had KGB minders for a month. They couldn't call home for a month. And they really, you know, out of the 80s spy stuff. But they got this collaboration going, and it still exists today. So now to give you some more technical stuff and get out of the, the history for a minute, this is the cyclotron in Dubna. Here's a person, so you get a scale. Um, the main beam that we run for our experiments is calcium-48. And the reason why we choose that is because calcium-48 is a double magic nucleus, meaning both its protons and neutrons have closed shell configurations. This makes this an incredibly stable nucleus. So when it uh, forms a compound nucleus with a target, it does not bring in that much excitation energy. So the system can stay together a little bit longer. And the U400 cyclotron is a calcium blowtorch. I mean, it just, just shoots this stuff out. And a typical experiment from beginning to end, we shoot roughly 10 to the 19 calcium ions onto a target. 
And this can last anywhere from one month to six months, depending on the cross-section that we're looking at. The targets are typically uh, provided by Livermore. Um, they're, here's a picture here, I know it's real hard to see, but they're wheels with titan very thin titanium backings and then either electroplate or deposit actinide oxides onto this and then this rotates at the end of the beam line. So the beam's coming this way. We rotate the wheels to dissipate heat so it doesn't burn through the target. After it hits the target, it goes through this, which is called the Duma gas filled recoil separator. It is a hydrogen filled separator and what happens is our recoil products come out and they undergo collisions with the hydrogen and it gets to some equilibrium state and we can tune the dipole magnets just so the products that we're interested in can fly through and hit our detector array at the back end. Things we don't want like beam particles, target particles that were unreacted, uh, fission products, they basically get steered away and we don't have to worry about them. The detector box, I have a better picture on the next slide so I'll save that uh, for that. This is not 100% as you can imagine. Uh, we still get a lot of background particles coming through the system, so for every one atom of interest, there's a sea of data that comes in that's not, not interesting in terms of new elements. So this is a better picture of our detector. Basically, these are silicon detectors, solid state. They're in this shoe box. This, the front is open, so the R stands for recoil product comes in, and what we hope is that it implants in the back of our detector box, and then we can just watch it decay because these all have position, sensitivity from top to bottom, and we can mark a time and an energy. So we're looking for a very specific signature. Excuse the cartoon, but the, the, kids, the kids love it. I give talks <laughs> in schools and they love it. Um, I think it's the faces. So what we're hoping for, of course, is that these will completely fuse together in a compound nucleus reaction. And after a, a short time, it's gonna emit neutrons and become our heavy element of interest. But that makes for a very nice uh, signature for us. This is a 116 example. Let's say we make 116 compound nucleus. This compound nucleus we're hoping is gonna implant itself in the detector. Then what we're gonna do is watch it decay. And these typically undergo alpha decay, which is very nice because we can guess ahead of time what the energy is gonna be you know, we know from systematics in the area now, we have enough data that we can make a guess as to half-life and energy. So we're gonna be looking for a series of alpha decays in this case, uh, with some you know, times that, you know, roughly what we expect. And the alpha decay does not impart that much momentum back to the parent nucleus. So the parent's really staying where it is, and the alpha particles are flying out. So, we're not only looking for this series with the right time, but they also have to be position correlated, meaning that we get an implant signal and then we're expecting it not to move too much. So if we see a decay and then we see a decay over here, we know those are not coming from the same decay chain. And then at the end, these things will eventually undergo spontaneous fission. The way we usually look for these is we actually go backwards. There's not that many fissions in the data set. So what we do is look for fissions and then try to back correlate the alphas to the parent. So we go a little bit backwards. Um, but those, it's a very distinct signature. The only hang up is when we get into odd nuclei because odd nuclei are not as regularly behaved. So sometimes there might be isomeric levels and whatnot. Complicates it a little bit, but that's one reason I'll show you we did all the even ones first because they're easy and then we went back and did the odd ones after the fact. Um, so I want to just throw some numbers out because these experiments take many, many months. And it's really cross-section is, is what's driving these. But why is the cross-section so low? Well, that has to do with the fact that we're trying to make a massive nucleon with, nucleus with a lot of Coulomb repulsion. And so here are the kind of numbers that we have. So let's say we start with, you know, I said 10 to 19. This is 5, 10 to 18 calcium beam particles. And here's a uh, curium-248 target. This is the 116 reaction. Several things can happen. What usually will happen is they come together and immediately just fall apart. They don't even fuse. And we lose a lot of it to these type of reactions, which are not interesting in terms of production. 
Every so often, so now we're down to 10 to the 10, of our original number here, we will make a compound nucleus. But even when that's made, we're not guaranteed that we're gonna see it because what usually happens, again, is it will split apart into something that's not interesting, like it'll just undergo quasi-fission here, or it might evaporate some heavier particles that are not really what we're interested in. But you see the numbers. One out of this many, we will get the heavy element we're looking for with the right signature. That's why these are such difficult experiments, because the statistics are so low. It's really hard. That's another reason, to be honest, why the US, why Germany overpassed, surpassed the US back in the 80s and 90s, because they were starting to devote more lead time in these experiments. And the reason why Russia then went on top of Germany is because they could devote nearly a year of beam time. So it's all about beam time and trying to beat these statistics, which are just nearly impossible. Um, but as I said, that's why we have the separator. Because again, for every one of these, we have this many things swirling around making dizzy that we don't want. And so that's where the separator comes in. It's not 100%, but it does cut down on the background quite a bit. So the first experiments that came out of this that really started to yield some meat were in the late 90s with uh, the announcement of 114. And to be totally fair, the isotope assignments have changed. So if you go back and look at these first papers, the isotopes weren't quite here. But that's because these were much more neutron rich than what had been discovered before. So the other elements before were more on the neutron deficient side. These did not link to anything at the time that was known. So these were decay chains sort of off in space without any tangible connection to the known, at that time, uh, table of isotopes. But as we got more data and we started to run excitation functions on each target, then we were able to go in and start making some isotope assignments, which have since been corroborated by others. But these are the current isotope assignments. And so the 114 that we believe was discovered first was this 289, which is the longest lived one at almost three seconds. And this decays down through a 112 that's 30 seconds down to just uh, SF activity. And then a couple years later, they did this with the curium target now. This was a P244 target, this was curium. And the nice thing is this one did connect to the daughters of this one. So we could start to get an interlocking idea of how things were behaving out in this area. The thing to note here, though, is looking down here. So these were 30 second guys. At that time, the heaviest known 112 isotope had a half-life that was roughly 10 to the 4 times shorter than these. And what this tells us is, remember I talked about these, the next stable proton configuration. Well, it's known now from theory that it's not going to just be a set thing where you hit 114 or hit the next magic proton and boom, you have a stable nucleus and that's it. It's actually going to be an island, so to speak, of stability where the effects from that closed shell are going to be felt somewhere farther out. So what we were observing here was sort of the first indication of the effects of the next closed proton shell coming in because we had such long half-life here compared to what was known. I'll also note that um, this was a very challenging experiment because there's not that much P244 in the world. Luckily, Livermore has a stash of it that we can use. Um, there is more, but it's in these spent reactor targets out at Savannah River. I'm not sure they'll ever recover it, um, but it's a very unique resource to have that material. And then a few years later, we did the twofer reaction where we got 113 and 115 in the same experiment, and then 118 came a few years later. Um, this was a California 249 target. This was AMRAC 243. Uh, you see the number of atoms that were detected in these experiments, very low. Okay, please indulge me, I have the cheesiest movie you've ever seen that our graphics team put together, but it helps me talk over everything I just said and give some visualization to it. Um, and if, if you're my generation, I will tell you, it looks a lot like the last Starfighter. Okay, a few. I, I, it gets less and less every time I reference the last Starfighter. Um, actually, it, does, it looks a lot like Guardians yes. of the Galaxy, too. So I have a, a, a current one. <laughs> so, let me, and I took off the cheesy voiceover because it's really horrible. 
But basically, what you're looking at is sort of an artist's rendition of what's happening when a heavy element's made. And it's actually not a bad rendition. It's pretty close. And you know, what you're seeing here is this is now the beam tube at the, at the cyclotron. And here come our calcium ions that have already been accelerated by the cyclotron. And even though the target is spinning, in terms of center of mass, the target looks like it's still to the ion coming in. So that's why the, Ber the berkelium atoms are just sitting there doing it. There's the last Starfire records. Um, or guardians ago. So most of the time, these things do not react, or they just kick the target out. And that's the stuff we don't want. But here's going to come this guy, and he's actually going to fuse with one of our target atoms. So at this point, we have a compound nucleus which still theoretically could break apart and not be anything. Oh, I just realized the target's wrong this, for one second. OK, um, <laughs> details, details. So here, here we go into our separator. And remember, the separator is not quite this efficient, but it does help quite a bit uh, because most of the time we do have a background particle that we're just not that interested in. And this is supposed to demonstrate it in planning into our silicon detector. And this part is pretty much what, what happens because this guy is not moving that much. So we're just watching it decay. And every time we get a decay, we get a signal that tells us time, energy, and position until we get the fission fragments. And that's what we actually look for and work our way back. The graphics department likes me to keep using that. So there you go. Thank you for indulging me in that one. Um, the, the story doesn't quite end with 118, although it's getting a little iffy. And that is, there were searches for element 120 a few years ago um, that resulted in nothing. And it's not that we expect every time to discover a new element, but the calculated, um, and unfortunately I don't have them on this uh, view graph, but the calculated cross sections or the limits on the cross sections from these reactions were so tiny that it sort of looks like have we reached that end. Um, GSI did a year-long irradiation a year or two ago to look for 119, and they did not find anything. So we're, we're unfortunately getting, which I don't think, it's not the end physically in terms of calculating whether these things exist, but in terms of being able to detect them and produce them, we're going to need some kind of beam changer in the technology front to get there. So this white circle, we probably at Livermore demonstrate is all the isotopes that we have discovered through our collaboration with the flare off lab because we didn't just do the elements we also went back and um, did the excitation functions as I said oh mine's dead too nah. <laughs> okay my handy emergency laser pointer um, and what you're seeing this imposed on top of is the some theoretical predictions for the so-called island of stability if it's centered at z equals 114. But the thing to note is actually the neutron number because I've been talking about protons, but that's not the whole story. The neutron number over here is 186, and we're nowhere near having that many neutrons in the system. So we think we're seeing the effects of it here with these longer half-lives in like the 112 isotopes. But we're a ways away from being over here. So we still can't say, even with all this data, that we're at the next closed proton shell or not, because we're still too many neutrons away. So what will help that? Well, as uh, EFRIB comes online, they probably won't have the intensities to start to make these reactions go. But if the radioactive beams get intense enough, that would be one of the only ways we could push out here because um, we're kind of also running out of target and beam combinations. We've marched up the actinide targets, marching up this way, but there's really nothing left with more neutrons in it. So we're sort of now hovering here and over here, and we're sort of stuck, literally and figuratively. Um, so this is my plug for the fact that it's also expanded beyond us and the flare-off lab. In 2010, we published the synthesis of element 117. And you see this huge list of names. And this was six different institutions, including Oak Ridge, UNLV, um, Vanderbilt University, Livermore, and so on and so on. And this was really a monster experiment, because this needed a berkelium 2.9 target. Berkelium has a half-life of about a year, so not long. 
Oak Ridge had been making it regularly as a byproduct as part of their California 252 production. For many years, they unfortunately just let it decay away and disappear. Uh, they got some money, and we put in some money, basically, to have them, one of these times, not throw the bird wings away and separate it out. And let me tell you, getting that out of the, uh, the reactor at Heifer, getting it separated and shipped over to Russia, made into a target, and do, do the experiment all before the half-life of the target starts to kill you, was just a huge, major accomplishment. And it's really amazing that we were able to pull this one off. Lots of uh, expert people on this list, by the way, in case you didn't notice. Um, Roger Henderson, former Darlene student as well. Ken Moody, Sarah Nelson was a high nose student. Um, there's me. Mark Stoyer was a Rasmussen student. Rolf Sadove was Darlene's postdoc and high nose postdoc, I believe. Phil Wilk, who was a Darlene student as well. So we have permeated all, all the ranks. So, let me real quick talk about naming because it's an interesting story. Um, then I'll get into the chemistry part. Naming is not trivial either. As, as hard as the experiment is, it's almost harder to get a name. Because IUPAC, uh, many years ago, and this will take me too much time to tell you a story, but before Russia and the US were friends in this vein, they were not friends, and there was a lot of conflict about names. So IUPAC came up with a uh, process for naming. And in that process, here's the key one right here. An independent confirmation must be made at a different lab. So now you've run a six month experiment. How are you gonna ask your friends across the ocean, hey, can you give up six months of your bean time? And by the way, you're not discovering anything, you're confirming ours. So for a long time, these experiments at the Floroff lab were going on since the late 80s. And only a couple years ago did we get to name one. Because uh, thankfully, back up the hill at Berkeley, coming back to Roots, they did a 114 confirmation and GSI did one as well. So they both did that. IUPAC gave us 114 and 116 because they're genetically correlated. Um, a lot of people tell me they hate the name Livermore, and I'm not gonna comment because I gotta tell you it wasn't my first vote either, but I, I, I point out this bullet. There is a public comment period. There it is. <laughs> the next time names are suggested and you don't like it, you can go to IUPAC and actually tell them you hate the name. So that's what I tell people. You don't like it, next time, public comment period. It is right here. But this process literally can take decades. So we as our collaboration have put in for discovery rights to 113, 115, and 117. GSI has done some confirmatory experiments. Japan has also claimed 113. They've already named it. So it'll be very interesting to see what IUPAC does in the next few years. So I think in the next few years, you'll see a few more names that you can complain about, and we'll see what they do with Japonium versus the Livermore Dugna claim on 113. So most everything I'm talking about so far is down here in the nuclear properties, where we're producing, we're doing cross-sections, we're looking at uh, nuclear states. But if we really want to then place it in the periodic table, we have to know its chemistry as I said in the beginning, because relativistic effects down here are really changing the game. So I'm a chemist by training, so I'm more migrated up to this part, but they really interplay off each other, thus this cheesy bullet right here. Um, we have to discover them nuclear through nuclear methods, and then we have to place them through chemical methods. So the two are intermixed, right? If Seaboard really got this, and he did both a lot, uh, Darlene Hoffman tried to carry that on, and so I think it's important we continue to, to think of it in, in terms of that. So what do we do at Livermore, specifically? Well, at Livermore, we're interested in um, element 114, like everyone is. That's sort of the big thing right now, because the theory is so weird on it compared to other uh, nuclides. So we've been developing some extraction methods. We're talking three-second nuclides, so this has to be very rapid. We're not talking equilibrium systems, we're talking contact, and how do we know that our chemistry is working that fast? Um, we have to produce and transport nuclides, and we have to do very rapid chemistry. So in my day, quote unquote, when I was in your seats, all the professors said in my day, so now I'm gonna say in my day, um, the automated radiochemistry equal sign graduate students that's what he was. And we would be up at the 88 inch if you were really 
on the wrong side of the person doing it, you've got the midnight shift, and you would do chemistry every minute, like this, all night long. It was fantastic. Not. <laughs> 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 That wouldn't work nowadays for many reasons. First of all, there's, there's not as many students, to be honest. I mean, we an army of students in our own group that did this. But the other thing is we don't get that much beam time. So if we're going to do these experiments, it's going to be short. And we got to make sure it's very efficient. And we get our chemistry done quickly. We can't have where someone at 2 in the morning was so tired they mixed up the acid and they screwed up a whole shit. Because that could be the whole experiment can be a shit. So automation is really important nowadays. Um, the other thing is highly functionalized ligands. Uh, we used to in the old days just do general liquid liquid extractions, but we also had several minutes to do them. Now if we have three seconds, we need a system that's going to really see that 114 and pull it and be done, and that's the whole chemistry, and then count it instantly. So this has to completely change. And then we can't just launch into 114 because we only make one at a time. So we have to do a whole suite of homolog experiments, meaning the other elements of group 14 and the surrounding groups so that when we get a few of these, we can see where it's going, what it acts, what it acts like. So I'm going to give you a little bit on each of these. I have to really uh, give credit to this. Uh, John Despotopoulos is at UNLV and Ralph Sedova's group. He's a Mart scholar, which means he sits at Livermore full time doing his uh, research. All of these days, he's writing. I okay, I did something horrible. I took him off the lab door so he would go in and he'd write. <laughs> I felt really bad, but um, but his research was looking at these crown ethers because they have very specific cavity sizes, and the thought was, could you pull, say, a 114 by tailoring the cavity size to the atom of interest? And I know Hino's group has been working on similar uh, type of systems, maybe not macros, uh, cyclic ligands so much, but uh, again, very specific extractants where it sees the element of interest and it pulls a single atom and you're done, basically. Um, so John's been uh, working on this for a while and he's looked at all the homologs uh, surrounding it. The other thing is you have to make it and you have to do something with it. So our colleagues at Texas A&M, Cody Folden, former Darwin student as well, he got an early career research grant through DOE to do online heavy element chemistry. The, the problem, not problem, but the challenge for him is there is no online heavy element chemistry at Texas A&M. So we've been trying to help him get that going. Um, they have a cyclotron, of course. They also have a separator. And he's had students working on recoil transfer chambers. Our part at Livermore is how do we get from here where there's a target the beam hits the target, it goes through separator, and it stops in a chamber. How do we now get that to an automated chemistry system that looks like that? And this is a interface that we've been developing where you could pull uh, your atoms of interest through a gas jet, and that's not new, people have been doing gas jet a long time. But here, this would basically dissolve it up so you would be left with your element of interest in some chemical matrix that's the start of the chemistry you want, and then you would transport it to our automated chemistry system, which this is like mom one or two, we keep fussing with it. Um, this is ongoing, we have a graduate student uh, from Penn State who's working on this system right now and hopes to integrate both of these. The idea being eventually there's a shack being built at Texas A&M at the cyclotron where these things could go, and we would do online chemistry where we make the atoms of interest and immediately do chemistry on them. How long did that take next cycle? So it depends where we can put it. Um, transport time is a killer in these things, especially we're probably not going to be able to do 114 at Texas A&M because that's a three second guy. We just can't get there. Um, but this whole thing could take less than a minute. And if it's less than a minute, then we can at least do the homolog studies. Um, they have different spots where they're thinking of installing this at the cyclotron. One is really far away, and that'll, that'll really hurt us. If they can get it closer to the end of the beam line, then probably a minute or two is what we're looking at. The other thing that we are trying to get into a little bit more, we've only sort of touched on it, is how you count it at the back end. So if you do chemistry, you're usually left with some aqueous phase. 
Aqueous phases take a very long time to dry down, because remember, these are alpha emitters, so we need a very thin, very uniform source to count. And that's often the long pull of the tent, is you can do your chemistry less than a minute, but now you're drying down and you're trying to get it counting and you've just killed your half-life. So if we do some kind of specific ligand, not this one in particular, but if we did some specific ligand that pulled our material, could that also be worked up so that could be where we count it? Now this gets into the hokey phrase of chemistry on a chip, but that really is what it is, is if you now had um, a place where you've lined this stuff up, say on a resin bed or some kind of support, and you flow your solution through, is there something we can use that will pick out our element 114s and they're ready to count? So that's that sort of has to be done too. And there has not been a lot done on that back end. The, um, Norwegians have had for a long time a system called CSAC, which is an automated uh, chemistry system, and they do liquid scintillation, where their extractant is the scintillator, and that saves them a lot of time. But if we want to do something where we don't need that much volume, um, can we just really get it down to what is the ligand, and where can we put it, and where can we grab our, our element? And then the point of all this is if we put it all together, so we have an extraction system that works, we have an automated chemistry system set up at an accelerator, and we've cut down our drying time. The idea would then be to start with the homologs of 114. So John Despotopoulos has done batch studies with these where he's made these tracers and done chemistry with them um, in a, you know, just in a tube with an extractant. The next step really is to do it online because the kinetics now of the transport from the cyclotron to the chemistry are going to play in your, your chemistry here. When you're just on a bench in a tube, you're getting better equilibrium now if you're doing a constant flow. So the question is, how does that affect chemistry? So that would be the first thing we would do at Texas A&M. Um, but that's not the only place things are being done. Um, GSI has this Tosca separator which even though they used it for their 119 search, was actually designed to be a chemistry separator. So they have done some really neat spectroscopic measurements, actually looking for electronic transitions in these heavy elements, um, doing in situ um, x-ray spectroscopy, and some of that's been done at Berkeley as well. And then this is the cartoon of the accelerator that the flare-off lab is currently building. It's called the Super Heavy Element Factory. It will be specific for only heavy element experiments. It really will be a very unique facility. And they are claiming um, beams here are something like 100 times more intense than what they currently have. We'll see how that flushes out. You know, they did do calculations, but when you turn the switch on, you never quite know what's going to come out. But if they get anywhere near that, this will revolutionize chemistry because the reaction rates Will, your statistics will improve if your intensity goes up on your beam. So that will be really amazing. Um, this is my requisite sales pitch slide because at Livermore, we are not an office of science lab, so heavy elements, believe it or not, has never been a very huge program. But we do a lot of other cool things, which I list here, and the automation that we do is tied into that. So we're able to, it, one hand shakes the other. We're doing automation for heavy elements, which is then applicable to all of these areas of technology as well. And as we develop it here, that gives us more leeway to do heavy element experiments. So it's, uh, and here's the 100 times greater production at Dubna than they have today. Um, my day job, quote unquote, is I'm the head of NIF Radiochemical Diagnostics. And we're pushing right now to actually have a laboratory, a little lab built at NIF and having a rapid extraction system where we can get samples out of the NIF chamber in less than five minutes and deposit them into the lab. Now we have our automation. We could do some very cool short lifetime experiments at NIF. So next time I come, I'll talk about that. Oh, that was my last slide. So um, this was a picture of the team several years ago. Uh, a lot of these people are, unfortunately, these three in the back, no longer at Livermore, but have gone on to, to do other, other cool things. Um, and I think I was, was going to say, I usually say something here as a plug, but I can't remember now because it's late in the day, <laughs> what I was going to say. Um, but um, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that because I cannot think of what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs>
downtown for a pizza or something, if you go to 116 North Livermore Avenue, there was a plaque. <laughs> so they actually had a really uh, a gala celebration. and uh, We're supposedly getting some art there, too. Right. So we have time for questions here. This is a wonderful talk. Very exciting. Alan. Uh, uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, question about, um, I, I know nothing about this field really, um, but is there any chance of, of using some sort of x-ray fluorescence analysis on the detector itself to pick out some of the chemistry uh, before you have to move it and do the normal chemistry? That's uh, sort of what the lab at GSI is doing. They've actually put a little array of detectors around. They have a similar shoebox of silicon detectors, and now they're putting x-ray detectors around it, and they're looking for x-ray transitions at the same time as they're looking for these decays. It's a little nascent in terms of how it can be applied to chemistry, but as some of these first experiments come out where they're actually able to correlate x-ray transitions with the nuclear transition, um, it does imply that if the production rates went up, that maybe we could use it for something like that. But right now, with single atom production, it's probably not going to be real helpful for chemistry. But again, if we let's say we did get 100 times the production rate, now you have enough statistics where you could use possibly X, some X-ray imaging of some kind to help you. Is the funding at Bubna reliable? It sure seems like it. They okay. never have a problem. <laughs> yeah, years ago I heard that they had money because they had an old contract in West Germany that they were still honoring. No. And that's why the lab was able to make it through the Rocky period. That might be. I actually am not sure. But after, I mean, during our time of the collaboration there, you know, Yuri Oganesian was very tied in with um, the Russian Academy of Sciences and the sort of quote was he's sort of a rock star with the, with the Russian Academy. And so I think if he said, we're going to discover these elements, they gave him resources to do that. I can't tell you these days with what's going on, how things look. I haven't talked to the team over there in quite a while, so I'm not sure if anything's changing. Do you think 2016 is a reliable date for finishing things so Probably not. <laughs> We're in almost 2015, and now they have broken ground and they have started building a building. But um, I, the last time I saw a picture, which granted was many months ago now, it was just the beginnings of a building. So I could say the building might be done by 2016, but I doubt the big saw rate will be on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent talk, really. Um, you might uh, mention some controversy about naming Sporgium. Oh, I should have, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the second question, um, as you know, um, uh, the discovery of fission dates back to 39, and there, there is still controversy. Who is uh, responsible, chemists or physicists? Yes. So <laughs> what is your take? <laughs> so the Sporgium controversy, um, well, even let me step back a, a little bit and talk about 104 and 105, too. So as I, as I said, there's, there are conflicting uh, discovery claims for 104 and 105 and 106, and it was the Soviet Union versus the U.S. And it's funny, because if you go back in the literature, you'll see papers that say Kruchetovium, which was 104. You'll see pa papers that say Hanium, which was the U.S. 105. Darlene Hoffman, to this day, will still call it Hanium. He refuses to call it Dubium. Um, <laughs> And so the IUPAC came in and, and you know, made this declaration of how names would be done, and they kind of at that time just did a consensus. So you, you get 105, US, you get 104, and I'll go off and be friends. When Seaborgium was finally given credit to the US team, Seaborg was still alive. And the IUPAC said, uh-uh, cannot name elements after a living person, which was a huge brouhaha, of course. And they went back, and I think it was Einsteinium that they realized the name had been initiated before he died. So they used that as the, as the basis for, well, he was still alive, so why can't we do it? But IUPAC just was really, um, I remember I was up at the Hill at the time this was all going on, and it just, I mean, meetings after meetings, and people traveling there and giving the pitch. And finally, 
and, and the unfortunate thing is, of course, he died not that long after the name was that. He at least could see it, but I mean, it, the irony is that he actually passed away not long after the, the element was finally granted to him. But, um, but yeah, that was the big brouhaha with that one is, is you can't name it after a living person, which no one knows to this day who, who came up with that rule or why that was, was there. But, um, um, and then, yeah, the fission story is also very interesting. And I usually refrain from making <laughs> any comments on that because you can see where both sides have a claim. So, but both sides didn't get Nobel Prize for it. No, that is true. That is true. Mm -hmm. so, oh, both sides. Um, Chemists and physicists. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really. <laughs> yeah. Leo, if you didn't like the name uh, Livermore, what was your vote? My personal vote was Da Vinci. M. Okay. <laughs> and I think flows much nicer just from a speaking point of view. And I can't even take credit for that because uh, we each had to submit a couple names. And I couldn't think of it. I honestly just couldn't think of it. Someone says, well, what do you want to name this L now? I have no idea. And my husband walks in and says, what about Da Vinci? M? Oh my gosh. That's right. And it, it made it actually pretty high in the ranking, but. Um, in the end, it's funny, most of the people that got to, the people that got to vote were the original authors. So a lot of them were no longer at Livermore, they were retired, or they moved on to other places. They all wanted Livermoreum, and the like two of us left at Livermore said we did. <laughs> so <laughs> we lost the vote. Um, I just think it, it's, it's hard to say. It's much like um, Copernicium, which is not my favorite. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> to our throw together this year. Uh, next week will be Morgan White and Los Alamos, occupying uncertainty and nuclear and cross-sectional data. <laughs>